This video will contain spoilers for A Song of Ice and Fire, Fire and Blood, and House of the Dragon. The House Targaryen established the greatest dynasty Westeros has ever known with dragons. It was the House of the Dragon that forged a realm of seven kingdoms together with fire and blood. But how is it that the Targaryens control such powerful creatures? How is it that only Targaryens or Valyrians are the only ones that have been able to do such a thing? Some people say the secret lies in ancient magics that only the Valyrians know. Euron Greyjoy says he found a magical horn amongst the smoking ruins of Valyria, a horn that can bind dragons to their will. Dragonbinder. That horn you heard I found amongst the smoking ruins that were Valyria, where no man has dared to walk but me. You heard its call and felt its power. It is a dragon horn, bound with bands of red gold and Valyrian steel graven with enchantments. The dragon lords of old sounded such horns before the doom devoured them. With this horn, Iron Man, I can bind dragons to my will. But with Daenerys in Marine, she only uses a whip that she finds in the fighting pits. And Nettles, she only uses sheep. She brings sheep stealer sheep every day. However, Daenerys also says, Dragons were tamed with binding spells and magical horns in Valyria. So maybe it's not the horn or ancient magic. Maybe it's luck. Maybe it's blood of the dragon. Maybe it's science. Maybe it's all of that. Maybe it's something no one ever thought of. The bonds the Targaryens have with their dragons are deeper than you could likely perceive. And we are told that, and shown that, recently in House of the Dragon, when Daemon is fighting with the crab feeder in the Stepstones, him and Caraxes move as one. And when Daemon gets struck with an arrow, it's Caraxes that screams in a fury. <laughs> Or when Rhaenyra is giving birth, Cyrax is feeling her pain. I think I have a way better understanding of the dragon bonds after House of the Dragon and with all the lore that we already have and it kind of blew my mind so let's get into it. There is a quote in the books that said several times and the quote is, who can know the heart of a dragon? The line has stuck with me and for many years I pondered on it and what it could mean and what is trying to be conveyed when they say it. The maesters say it a few times. So let's start with the most beautiful dragon in the known world to have ever existed, Sunfire. When Aegon sneaks onto Dragonstone, no one knows that he is there at first, but then something unexplainable happens. And there, Aegon might have remained hidden yet harmless, dulling his pain with wine and hiding his burn scars beneath the heavy cloak, had Sunfire not made his way to Dragonstone. We may ask what drew him back to the Dragonmont, for many have. Was the wounded dragon with his half-healed broken wing driven by some primal instinct to return to his birthplace, the smoking mountain where he had emerged from his egg? Or did he somehow sense the presence of King Aegon on the island, across long leagues and stormy seas, and fly there to rejoin his rider? Some go so far as to suggest that Sunfire sensed Aegon's desperate need, but who can presume to know the heart of a dragon? It's not just Sunfire that appears when he's needed. We see this in the show Game of Thrones and in the books as well in Marine. Drogon shows up just when Daenerys needs him. And what happened with Daemon and Caraxes in the show also happens with Daenerys and Drogon in the books. Game of Thrones, of course, changed everything in the marine scene except for the fact that Daenerys is in trouble and Drogon shows up. So in the show, the harpy attack, Drogon shows up just as Daenerys is about to die to take his mother out of there. In the books, the chapter is actually pretty insane. A lot is going on. Firstly, it's important to describe the climate of Marine and what's leading up to this. Daenerys has brokered a peace treaty. She's married Hisdar and opened the fighting pits. 
However, it's important to understand how she feels. She feels lost, defeated, and powerless. The young Kai have started selling slaves again due to her agreement. She feels mocked. Daenerys is described at her wedding feast as brooding, wrapped in black thoughts, silent, only speaking when spoken to. She's disgusted by what she's agreed to. She was getting angry too. She feels she has betrayed the slaves of young Kai. She calls the slave market that was set up an abomination. She does not trust the slavers, nor does she trust Hisdar. She feels Hisdar's peace will break and she needs to be ready. Daenerys ends up going to the fighting pits. When she walks in, she's offered some honey locusts. The honey locusts are actually an assassination attempt on Daenerys. They are poisoned. Hisdar is looking really shady, by the way. The fighting pit scene in the books were much more graphic. The Miranese are actually pretty brutal. And one fight in particular, Daenerys stops because it's dwarves with wooden sticks versus lions. Aside from Ser Barristan, Daenerys also has her guard with her. And this particular guard, for some godforsaken reason, did not make Game of Thrones, but his name is Strong Belwaz. So Strong Belwaz does eat the honey locust, the whole bowl, and he starts to feel sick. And just as Daenerys has had all she can take of the fighting pit, she wants to leave and something happens just as Strong Belwaz falls to his knees. The tumult and the shouting died. 10,000 voices stilled. Every eye turned skyward. A warm wind brushed Danny's cheeks. And above the beating of her heart, she heard the sound of wings. Two spearmen dashed for shelter. The pitmaster froze where he stood. The boar went snuffling back to Barsena. Strong Belwaz gave a moan, stumbled from his seat, and fell to his knees. Above them, all the dragon turned dark against the sun. His scales were black, his eyes and horns and spinal plates blood red, ever the largest of her three. In the wild, Drogon had grown larger still. His wings stretched twenty feet from tip to tip, black as jet. He flapped them once, and he swept back above the sands, and the sound was like a clap of thunder. Just as Strong Belwaz fell over from the poison locust, Drogon appeared and took her out of there. And if you look in House of the Dragon, Caraxi seems to know when Damon needs him. When he's on the bridge with Otto, Caraxi just pulls up on Otto on his own. No whistles are blown. No commands are given. He doesn't say, come here, Caraxi. Caraxi just pulls up on his own. And he seems to know exactly what Damon wants him to do without a word being said. For example, when Damon questions the King's Guard, Caraxes leans in to intimidate at the exact moment that he should with no words. We see it again with Rainies in the Dragon Pit. Her dragon, Maylees, the Red Queen, screams in the faces of the Greens, and no commands are ever given. And you may say, okay, well, that's just because it's cinematically cool, but actually, Drogon does the same thing with Daenerys in the books. Firstly, when it comes to Dracarys, Daenerys chooses that command. It means dragon fire in High Valyrian, but Daenerys doesn't know anything about training dragons or bending dragons to her will, so she trains her dragons like you would your dog. All the Valyrians are dead. She doesn't know much about dragons other than what she's learned from her psycho brother. And he never had a dragon, but she teaches them commands. Stop that, Rhaegal, Danny said in annoyance, giving his head a swat. You had the last one. I'll have no greedy dragons. She smiled at Ser Jorah. I won't need to char their meat over a brazier any longer. So I see, Dracarys. All three dragons turned their heads at the sound of that word, and Viserion let loose with a blast of pale gold flame that made Ser Jorah take a hasty step backward. Danny giggled. Be careful with that word, sir, or they're like to send your beard off. It means dragon fire in High Valyrian. I wanted to choose a command that no one was like to utter by chance. Now, in House of the Dragon, people use Dracarys, but I don't know if this is something that the Valyrians or Targaryens traditionally use. 
But that's not even the point, really, because in Marine and the North, we see Viserys and Rhaegal burning everything right along with Drogon, and they weren't given any commands, only Drogon was. So who knows? But the point is that Drogon does things without Daenerys giving commands. When Daenerys meets with the young Kai, it's a little different in the show, but the same kind of meaning. I say you're mad. Am I? Danny shrugged and said, Dracarys. The dragons answered. Rhaegal hissed and smoked. Viserion snapped and Drogon spat swirling red-black flame. It touched the drape of Grasdan's tokar, and the silk caught in half a heartbeat. Golden marks spilled across the carpets as the envoy stumbled over the chest, shouting curses and beating at his arm until Whitebeard flung a flagon of water over to douse the flames. You swore I should have safe conduct, the young Kashi envoy wailed. Do all the young Kai whine so over a singed tokar? I shall buy you a new one. If you deliver up your slaves within three days, elsewise, Drogon shall give you a warmer kiss. She wrinkled her nose. You've soiled yourself. Take your gold and go and see that the wise masters hear my message. If you really pay attention, you can see that Drogon differentiates just how much Drakkar is he supposed to be doing. So she was not trying to kill him, only to intimidate him. And Drogon somehow knew just the right amount of flame to spit. Daenerys even calls it a warm kiss. How is it that Drogon knew to do that? And how does he know when she needs him? Quaith tells Daenerys the dragons know. Then she saw her mask is made of starlight. Remember who you are, Daenerys, the stars whispered in a woman's voice. The dragons know, do you? I think I know how they know. If we go back to the fighting pit scene in Marine, something very interesting happens. Perhaps he was just some common man who wanted bards to sing of him. He darted forward, his boar spear in his hands. Red sand kicked up beneath his heels and shouts rang out from the seats. Drogon raised his head, blood dripping from his teeth. The hero leapt onto his back and drove the iron spear point down at the base of the dragon's long scaled neck. Danny and Drogon screamed as one. It says Danny and Drogon screamed as one, just like Caraxes and Damon scream as one, just like Cyrax and Rhaenyra scream as one. This seems to hint at mingled spirits. Now, you've probably never heard of that phrase unless you've read A World of Ice Empire, but it's basically the word the maesters use to describe warging, skin changing, and green seers. Now, I know what you may be thinking skin changing. Well, yes, skin changing, skin changing on a level that you've never imagined, skin changing on the same level, if not a greater level than a green seer. But let's talk about it. So to talk about skin changing and dragon bonding, we need to go to the north and we need to go to the godswood of Winterfell with Jojen and Bran in a clash of kings. So Bran and Jojen and Mira are in the godswood and Jojen is trying to get to the bottom of what frightens Bran so much. And as the reader, he has these dreams of trees and then he's warging into summer. So Jojen says he will tell him about his green dreams if he shares, if Bran shares his dreams. But Bran does not want to share his dreams. Did you dream of a wolf? He was making Bran angry. I don't have to tell you my dreams. I'm the prince. I'm the Stark in Winterfell. Was it summer? You be quiet. The night of the harvest feast, you dreamed you were summer in the godswood, didn't you? Stop it, Bran shouted. Summer slid toward the weirwood, his white teeth bared. Jojen Reed took no mind. When I touched summer, I felt you in him, just as you are in him now. So Jojen basically implies that Bran is is always in summer whether he's dreaming whether he's warging whether he's skin changing or whether he's just standing there bran is always in summer this is like kind of crazy right but bran is a green seer so it's likely a different type of skin changing so skin changing and warging is mingling your spirits but it's also telepathic in nature so real quick 
the wolves, the Stark dire wolves, they always show up just when they're needed. How many times has Ghost saved John's ass, showed him the milk water where the wildlings were, led him to the horn in the dragon glass? I mean, Summer feels all of Bran's emotions. Shaggy Dog acts just like a maniac, just like Rickon. The reason the wolves and all the Stark children mirror each other is because their spirits are mingled. They're joined. And if you look at House of the Dragon, the behind the scenes, these dragons mirror the personalities of their riders. But I also think since dragons live so long and have so many riders, things get tricky and we're going to get to that. But skin changing has a lot of rules and risks. And Jojen stresses this to Bran. He tells Bran to mark trees and bring back rabbits and do things as Bran while he's in summer. And who is summer? Jojen prompted. Bran the boy and summer the wolf. You are two then. Two, he sighed. And one. He hated Jojen when he got stupid like this. At Winterfell, he wanted me to dream my wolf dreams, and now that I know how, he's always calling me back. Remember that, Bran. Remember yourself, or the wolf will consume you. Jojen specifically tells Bran, you are you, and the wolf is the wolf. But the Targaryens seem to do the opposite, especially Daenerys. Daenerys never reminds herself that she's not a dragon. She uses very specific language like, I am the dragon, I am blood of the dragon. She constantly considers herself and the dragon as one. And in her dragon dreams, she lets dragon fire consume her. And I wonder if the Targaryen madness that people like to hint at comes from Targaryens mingling their spirits with dragons over the centuries. To better understand what's happening, I want to talk about a powerful skin changer amongst the wildlings named Vamir Sixskins, another character that doesn't make the show, but he's an evil thing. He's a skin changer of wolves, shadow cats, a bear, and he controls them all. There is another skin changer named Orel. Orel has an eagle, but Vamir ends up taking the eagle that once belonged to Orel. Orel is dead. He hates Jon Snow, and when Orel dies, that hate passes to his eagle. Once a horse is broken to the saddle, any man can mount him, he said in a soft voice. Once a beast's been joined to a man, any skin changer can slip inside and ride him. Orel was withering inside his feathers, so I took the eagle for my own. But the joining works both ways, Warg. Orel lives inside me now, whispering how much he hates you and I can soar above the wall and see with the eagle's eyes. So Bloodraven explains this to Bran. It's called Shadow on the Soul. So when Bran is training with Bloodraven, he's teaching him how to skin change ravens, and Bran notices someone else in the raven. Someone else was in the raven, he told Lord Brendan once he had returned to his own skin. Some girl, I felt her. A woman. Of those who sing the song of the earth, his teacher said. Long dead, yet a part of her remains, just as a part of you would remain in summer if your boy's flesh were to die upon the morrow. A shadow on the soul, she would not harm you. Do all the birds have singers in them? All, Lord Brendan said. Now what does this have in common with the dragons? And that's probably what you're asking yourself. So let's go to Tumbleton. Let's go to Tumbleton and let's read this quote. Lords Piper and Dedding, seated together atop a low rise, burned with their squires, servants, and sworn shield when the bronze fury chanced to take note of them. An instant later, sea smoke fell upon him. Alone of the four dragons on the field that day, sea smoke had a rider. Sir Adam Valerion had come to prove his loyalty by destroying the two betrayers and their dragons. And here was one beneath him, attacking the men who had joined him for this fight. He must have felt duty bound to protect them, though surely he knew in heart that his sea smoke could not match the older dragon. This was no dance, but a fight to the death. Vermithor had been flying no more than twenty feet above the battlefield when sea smoke slammed into him from above, driving him shrieking into the mud. 
Men and boys ran in terror or were crushed as the two dragons rolled and tore at one another. Tails snapped and wings beat at the air, but the beasts were so entangled that neither was able to break free. Benji Cop Blackwood watched the struggle from atop his horse, 50 yards away. Vermithor's size and weight were too much for Sea Smoke to contend with. Lord Blackwood said many years later, and he would surely have torn the silver gray dragon to pieces if Tessarion had not fallen from the sky at the very moment to join the fight. Who can know the heart of a dragon? Was it simple bloodlust that drove the Blue Queen to attack? Did the she-dragon come to help one of the combatants? If so, which? Some will claim the bonds between a dragon and dragon rider run so deep that the beast shares his master's loves and hates. But who was the ally here, and who the enemy? Does a riderless dragon know friend from foe? The maester said some will claim the bond between a dragon and dragon rider runs so deep that the beast shares his master's loves and hates. In this specific scene, the riders are dead, so it seems there is some shadows on the souls of dragons as well. So that would mean that Visenya, Balon, and Lena are all shadows on the soul of Vagar, or is it just the first rider? So would it be just Visenya? Vaymer says that the joining works both ways and that part of Aura lives in him too now. There's an exchange, so the whole idea is interesting. And if I could see and I could see how, for example, if Aemon had Visenya, Balon, and Rhaenys whispering to him how that could drive a person crazy. But I don't think that's necessarily the case. I do think this adds to the complication of controlling dragons. It seems a lot goes into controlling dragons. And let's talk about this real quickly. Firstly, it's a Targaryen tradition to place a dragon egg in the child's cradle when they're infants, to bond with the dragon in the egg, much like Daenerys does when she has her eggs. Daenerys has dragon dreams of Drogon before he's ever even born. In Rhaenyra, Cyrax hatched from an egg and Rhaenyra is the first person to ever bond with her. Cyraxes had one other rider, Aemon, Rhaenys' dad. All of Rhaenyra's children's dragons were birthed from eggs. Sunfire, Aegon's dragon, Aegon is the only rider of Sunfire. Think when you hatch these dragons from eggs, I feel like your bond might be a little bit stronger. They might be a little easier to control but when you have an old dragon like Vagar, we've seen in the series Aemon had a hard time controlling Vagar. Vagar did not listen to any commands and she killed Luke so was this a dragon that went rogue or were Aemon and Vagar spirits mingled and Vagar knew deep down Aemon wanted to kill Luke or did Vagar do it on her own because Arax burned her in the eye was their bond not as strong because Vagar had three previous riders? There is a lot of factors that go into this. Like, But if we go back to claiming a dragon versus raising a dragon from an egg, if you look at the Stark children, their bonds with their wolves are as strong as they are because they've, ha they've raised those wolves since they were puppies. So Vermeer's animals don't have the same love for him as the Stark wolves have for them. And we're going to talk about that. If it's skin changing, if it's truly skin changing the skin changing we see is very different like Bran when he works summer or Hodor he's like in a sleep like state but there are other types of skin changing and the skin changing of a green seer seems different like Bran he can control thousands of ravens in the show at one time he also has access to some network of information without ever closing his eyes and Vamir Vamir his skin changes a bear, but he also rides that bear into battle. Vermeer Six Skins, a small mouse of a man whose steed was a savage white snow bear that stood 13 feet tall on its hind legs. And whenever the bear and Vermeer went, three wolves and a shadow cat came following. John had been in his presence only once, and once had been enough. 
So Vamir is able to ride his snow bear into battle, much like the Targaryens do with their dragons. But also, there is another person or a group of people I suspect to be skin changers, and that's the White Walkers. I know, it sounds crazy. But the White Walkers do control the Whites, and how they do it, I think it's a form of skin changing or warging. That's why when the White Walkers die, the Whites all die with them. But skin changing like this, we have never quite seen before, nor do we really understand exactly how it works. But we definitely know that part of the human in the White remains, just like with skin changing, the shadows on the soul. Like when the White, they bring back to Castle Black, um... They know where the Lord's Commander's rooms are or when Bruni attacks Osha. But in order to understand how it works and how the Valyrians learned to do this, we need to go back into ancient times before Westeros was Westeros. Quaith has always told you to go forward, we must go back. And we are going back into ancient Westeros and Essos. And when we are talking dragons, we need to go back before the first brick was ever laid in the Valyrian Freehold. And we will be going back there and continuing our search for answers in the next video of this series. I hope you guys like part one and part two will be out shortly. As always, thanks for watching. Thanks to everyone that supports me. Okay, my sweet summer children. Have a good day.